Well, welcome again uh, here for the Lord's Seminary. We are beginning a new course with this uh, lecture this evening. Uh, we finished up a module on a biblical foundation for missions. It's all part of our Reformed Missiology, Reformed Study of Missions. Uh, this course that we're beginning now has to do with uh, Reformed or biblical church planting, uh, the establishment of new churches, and how we go about doing that. We're going to be looking at the spiritual nature of church planting. We're going to be discussing uh, methodology uh, that arises from the scriptures. Uh, we have to be very careful. We don't adopt methodologies from the world, uh, from business, or any other uh, type of uh, uh, organizational structure and way of, of doing things. Um, we must do the Lord's work the Lord's way as he is given to us uh, in uh, his word. So uh, this evening we want to begin with understanding the work of uh, church planting and I'll uh, open us up with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have uh, given to us your word to direct us and we thank you that you're gathering together your people from every nation, tribe, and tongue uh, to surround your throne with praises. Help us in this work of uh, the establishing of new congregations uh, that are based upon your word. Help us to understand these things, to overcome uh, worldly ways and methodologies, and to do things your way, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, looking at, let's see our slideshow here. There we go. Whoop. All right, let's get that screen shared. Oh, yes, we want to look at that. So in discussing a biblical church planting, uh, with this new course, we want to understand the work of church planting itself, and we want to look at some key insights in, in this particular topic um, for this biblical foundation, how we go about establishing churches on the basis of God's word. So tonight, we want to look at the spiritual nature of church planting in the first place. Uh, first to last, this whole work is a spiritual undertaking. Now, there are some aspects of it that, you know, uh, arranging for a meeting place and putting out information to people where we're going to gather and what we're going to do and and so forth that, you know, have a lot of similarities with the world, just as a business might advertise, a political party might advertise and so forth. You know, we, we do those sorts of things in our particular cultures. Uh, but the whole of the work of, of church planting is a spiritual undertaking. It is the implementation of all that the Bible teaches concerning the nature and the purpose of the church. It is the application of the power and work of God the Holy Spirit who draws uh, men to the Savior uh, and he is the one who unites them together in the church. And he gifts and equips uh, them for the work and witness of the body of Christ. And not only that, the establishment of a congregation is a frontal assault on the forces of Satan. Those who set their minds and their hearts to establish a new uh, congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, invite and they must expect opposition from the evil one. It's as if you 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 take these steps, you you engage in this work, you're going to have a target painted on you. Uh, and Satan is going to be aiming his fiery darts at you, uh, both overt and covert, both uh, very much uh, seen and subtly also as well. Those kinds of things can take place. But 
You also have, if you're undertaking this work of spiritual uh, uh, planting of churches, you have the great privilege of being used as a tool in God's hand as he gathers uh, his people together uh, in, in a congregation and he builds a habitation for himself among them, you know, a house for his name and where his spirit will dwell in the midst of uh, his people. And so no methodology conceived by man can adequately, uh, adequately reflect the depth of the spiritual nature of church planting. Uh, those who involve themselves in the work regularly stand in awe of the power of God and the truth expressed by the Lord Jesus Christ when he says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. You're, you're just a tool in the hands, but Jesus is using you. The Lord and King of the church would be using you as a church planter. And it's all his work through you, but ultimately it's all his, and that he is the one who is doing this. So as we engage in this work first, um, we need to make sure that we have a good understanding of biblical ecclesiology. That is, what does the Bible say about the church? What does the Bible say, you know, because the church is unique, it's different from other other uh, organizations on earth. It's different from political parties. It's different from uh, business organizations. It's different from political parties. It is different from, you know, the, the Mindanao uh, Yamaha Motorbike Club or whatever you, you might want to uh, establish. It's, it's different from everything. Uh, it is unique and that it is God's organization, it's God's idea, it's God's plans and purposes being worked out. So it is vital for you as a church planter and for those who work with you in, in the gathering together of church uh, to have a well thought out concept of the nature and purpose of the church. Uh, unless you understand what the blueprint is given by Christ, of what the church is like, just like when God showed Moses on the mountain in, in Mount Sinai, the pattern for the tabernacle to be built, because it was a copy of heaven, uh, of the court of heaven and, and God's throne room in heaven. So in the same way, you need to have a good idea what the blueprint is of uh, the plan for uh, what God's church uh, should be. And that arises for us from the scriptures. And so the doctrine of the church that comes from scripture must be something that you study and study and study well. And those who work with you, to that they too understand what, uh, what you are doing. Uh, if you, you know, those who have that responsibility to, to establish a congregation, to guide it, uh, to guide the development of it as it grows by various stages, uh, you, you must have a biblical understanding of what the church is to be and to do. And so the Reformed faith presents a deep and robust understanding of the nature, the purpose, the work, the structure of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these biblical concepts are going to impact every aspect of the work and the ministry of church planting. So it's important from the beginning, uh, as you as you begin this process, to 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 stress what the Bible teaches about the kind of local church Christ intends to build. And you need to make sure that you, let's say, if you are the organizing pastor, if you're the the, the man who is going to help oversee this work and to encourage others to gather into it, that people see this is not just John's idea or Rocky's opinion, uh, but this is what God says in his word, and you show them from the Bible these things. So they realize it's not your idea, it's not your plan, but it is God's. 
and they they see uh, what that is. So that that means you're going to have to take some time uh, of laying down the biblical principles for what this is, and and also too that you uh, be ready to change your opinions and your concepts to conform to Scripture, because you might have you know, oh, well, this is how we did church over there. And and you're taking your customs and your traditions and the ways that you have kind of worked out for you and you're trying to transpose them, bring them over to here. And, and they may not be biblical ideas. They may not be biblical uh, ways of doing things. And so you've got to be humble uh, before the Lord to have your ideas changed as well as as how you are going to be engaged in this work and so uh, we want to have the type of local church that is the what we see grow out of scripture now they'll be unique from culture to culture and unique uh, and and just from place to place as God has sovereignly drawn together that collection of people who will compose or comprise that particular congregation itself, um, you know, but it will, uh, on examination, bear all the marks of a true biblical church uh, because it's been organized, it's directed, it's shaped, it's conformed to the pattern that's given to us in Christ Jesus. And so there is a unity here and also a diversity. But you you must, you know, how how the church is going to look, though, and its basic organization and structure is going to be the same in Mindanao or in uh, Phnom Penh or in uh, Mizoram. It, it, it's, just, it's just how the Lord has us... Uh, determined for the churches to be organized. So let's look at some of the scriptural implications here with regards to scriptural theology of the church. Um, what we're going to cover in this particular summary here um, it isn't going to be all the detail of scripture with regards to the church. That's a whole different course altogether you know, of ecclesiology. And that's just a survey. It's just a sampling of not the whole in depth. But what we do want to see, it's important for everyone involving themselves in the work of starting a, a new church to have a clear working knowledge of uh, of this teaching, this doctrine that we are now implementing, uh, that that we understand what is the pattern in Scripture, how does what does this look like, how does it operate, and then therefore we will know what to do. You know, think of it this way: if you have a a carpenter and you're building a house, uh, it's helpful to have a plan and to communicate what that plan is, so that everybody involved in building the house can look at the plan and say, oh, okay, this is how it's supposed to be, instead of just one guy having it in his head and, 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 and not sharing with others what they're to do. It, it's helpful for everyone to understand how all of this is to come together. Uh, so what we want to do is look at some aspects of the doctrine of the church which impact the establishing of a new congregation um, and, and so they will illustrate the need uh, for church planters uh, for overseeing uh, sessions, board, elders as they oversee the work of planting and establishing churches, and uh, for uh, presbyteries, how they uh, always uh, keep in their minds how biblically these things are to take place. And so it means everybody involved in the work needs to have an understanding, a biblical understanding, and everyone understand and are agreed as to this is what Scripture teaches and this is what we are, are going to do. Because the church is the body of Christ, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, those who are involved in starting a new 
uh, congregation must be ready to embrace those whom God sends as needed and useful members of that work. You know, sometimes uh, here in America, you, you would see, well, we are going to have a church that it, we're going to plant a church among people who are in the artistic community. And so everyone who's involved in the arts, uh, that's, those, that's our primary target audience. Well, somebody shows up and they work in concrete or they work, you know, or they're a chicken farmer or something. They don't fit that pattern that these people have had, but the Lord has sent them there. And they, you know, the people who have, oh, we want to have, you know, for the arts and this is what we want to be, you know, the, they would tend to reject the chicken farmer or the worker in concrete or something of that nature. So, uh, you know, and that's an unbiblical way of doing things. The Lord is going to send to and to gather into the church those whom he has appointed, he has saved to gather together. And so we need to be careful that we don't so limit our our approach to certain ethnic groups or to certain economic socio and economic groups or certain levels of education or or languages or anything of that nature um jesus is going to send to that congregation those whom he has sovereignly appointed and and brought in uh to be embraced as part of the church and uh and also too if you are planting a church you must be ready to demonstrate the love and concern of Christ to the community of which you are a part, even though uh, you're, you're a small group and, and relatively weak in the eyes of the world. Another thing is, because the church is the bride of Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 5, those who are involved in starting a new congregation are going to face uh competing realities. On the one hand, you are working towards an ever-increasing measure of sanctification in the lives uh, of, of your member, yourself and your members, and their corporate life together as the faithful bride uh, awaiting patiently the return of the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. But on the other hand, God is adding to your number people who are being saved out of the world. And therefore, they, they, their level of sanctification is relatively low at that stage. They haven't grown in grace as much. How are you going to incorporate them? How are you going to disciple them to, uh, to deal with the frustrations of people who are not as mature in, in the Lord, in their understanding, in their practices, in their habits, and so forth? You may have people who are being saved who come out of other theological traditions or or they they uh, want to be part of your congregation, but they haven't yet grasped all of the doctrines of grace as yet. How do you incorporate them as part of the body of Christ Jesus? Uh, for those in need of basic instruction, uh, you know, if these people are being saved out of the world or or haven't been well taught in other congregations that are coming to you, you, you need to have plans of how to give them basic rudimentary teaching in God's word. And so you're going to have to feed them, but you're also going to have to feed those people who are more mature in the Lord. And the people who are more mature in the Lord might be a bit uh, frustrated because you're not giving them as much meat as you are milk to those who are relatively young uh, in the Lord. And how do you how do you can how do you deal with that? Uh, you don't have two separate services. You don't have two two separate organizations. But you learn to learn to provide that instruction as well. Another reason is because the church is the building of God, as 1 Peter 2 brings out, 
Um, he is in the process of completing those who are involved uh, in starting a new congregation. And you're going to face discouragement more than other people as, as you look, you know, if you look out at a building that's being built, it's a mess. There, there are all kinds of, you know, concrete blocks over there and, and the steel rebar over there. And you've got the mess and debris of the wood and everything else. And just all it, it you know, bu a, a building while it's being built, you kind of have to imagine what the finished product is going to look like, because at the time you're going to be discouraged. And, and, the, and it's, you know, let's say if you've got a, a construction site and there's been a lot of rain, now you've got all the mud puddles around. Now you've got, you kind of wait for things to dry out and things aren't progressing as quickly. What you thought you were going to complete in a month, it's now month three and it's still not finished. And so you're going to have to, uh, in church planting and establishing of congregations, you're going to face times of discouragement. Uh, in in these ways, um, and, and you you know the long delays and waiting for the arrival of of more people to gather together, more living stones to to gather together the church, and they you know get to the point where they're self sustaining and self governing and self propagating, um, and they are self consciously a church. This is who we are. This is not just a Bible study. We are a church of the Lord Jesus Christ here. And that we will we will be bound together and to live together as a congregation of God's people. Another reason or another implication is because the church is a foretaste of heaven, as Hebrews 12 uh, mentions to us. Those who are involved in the process of starting a new congregation will constantly face heavenly scrutiny to see you are carefully following the plans that are laid down in God's word so that the church's worship, its preaching, the fellowship, the ministry and outreach will welcome God's people uh, to heaven because the church has a God-given order and government as Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 16 bring out, those who are involved in starting a new congregation must be careful to follow the word of God and the order and structure that he has given rather than the structures and strategies developed by men. And so you must be willing <coughs> to use the keys of discipline uh, that Christ has given for the new church's blessing and benefit, even in the earliest months, if someone is not behaving as a Christian should, according to God's word, and they stubbornly refuse to uh, listen to you, listen to the commands of scripture in that regard, and you've warned them and you've worked with them, instructed them, and they still stubbornly refuse, you may have to say, you may no longer be considered uh, by us as a Christian, and they'd be set outside the communion of the church and until they repent and manifest biblical repentance in that. Um, and so you must, you know, some, some people are very, um, are very uh, wary. Of, oh, no, no, no. We don't want to turn away anybody who comes. Well, you need to carefully discern uh, what is, what people are, are there for. And to be able to, you know, are these people who are teachable according to scripture or are their minds made up to make your, that congregation to conform to their concepts as opposed to what scripture has to say? I often uh, remind uh, men who are planting churches, a lot of times you're going to have people who come to you who have been dissatisfied in other congregations you need to understand what they are against, but also what are they for? What are the things that they, uh, their ideas, their concepts of what church ought to be? You, everybody needs to be on the same standard of what God's word says. Now, that means you're going to have to teach them and you're going to have to instruct them and say, 
you know, this is who and what we are, what we believe according to the scriptures. If you can't, if you can't accept that, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, there may be other places for you to worship that, you know, that that's okay. Um, we don't want you being part of us unless you're convinced this is biblical. This is what God's, you know, that we accept the standard of God's word. And that can be a tough thing uh, to, to say to people, you know what, um, this may not work out uh, for you. Another uh, implication of scriptural uh, theology of the church is because the church is a God-given mission, as remember Jesus in Matthew 28 telling us to go and to take this gospel to all the nations, teaching them everything that he has commanded. Those who are involved in starting a new congregation do not have the luxury of waiting until they are larger or stronger or better equipped before beginning uh, their missionary work of evangelism and discipleship. So these are some of the scriptural um, implications theologically when we are talking about planting of churches. Another thing too, we mentioned that uh, uh, this is a spiritual assault on the gates of hell. The worker church planting uh, must be seen from the enemy's perspective. Uh, of all the projects that are undertaken by men, the one that Satan must surely fear and oppose the most is the involvement of believers with their savior in the work of establishing a new church. Uh, because you have uh, begun an assault upon Satan and, and his people, uh, upon, upon them as the kingdom of God is advancing. It's like Jesus, remember, used the example of the yeast in the lump of dough of, of the woman making bread and the yeast is working its way so that it works its way through the whole lump of uh, the dough of bread. And so uh, in the same way, the church is advancing throughout uh, the world. Uh, listen to Jesus's words in Matthew 16. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is attacking. The church is assaulting uh, the world, assaulting Satan. And Satan is, they're trying to defend it. Uh, but the gates of hell are not strong enough to withstand this onslaught uh, from the church. Satan and his forces are defeated by the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those who are involved in this work of starting a new church should not be surprised when there is opposition to the church from the community, uh, when meeting locations become hard to find, or when financial instability threatens the future of the work. Satan and his forces will do all that they can to prevent one more taste of heaven on earth and one more safe haven for the saints of God uh, from appearing on the scene. And so a new mission work should expect to face the fiery trials of opposition and difficulty as a part of the spiritual nature of the uh, church planting uh, process. Uh, consider too, uh, the, give us a little bit of uh, history here of uh, church growth uh, movement from a reform perspective, um, we can trace it back uh, inadvertently to a book published by a Presbyterian minister in 1886, uh, a man by the name of Dr. John Nevius. He was a Presbyterian uh, missionary in China and what uh, had been done in mission approach at that time is you would go in and establish a station, they would call it. And you'd have several missionaries working together in a place and reaching out to the community. 
uh, but it was not planting and establishing of churches very well in, in that. And uh, Nevius began looking at how they would um, approach the work. Uh, if they had people who would come into the church services, they would give them a bag of rice. Well, you had a lot of people all of a sudden showing up and saying they were Christians and coming to the church. And then when the rice was not being handed out, they'd leave and go someplace else. And the term uh, rice Christian uh, came uh, because of that. And Nevius was looking at these kinds of things and going, you know what, this isn't working. This, this isn't the way scripturally how we are to be conducting uh, foreign missions and so forth. So he began to call into question the methods that were employed by the previous generations of missionary work. Um, and so he wrote a series of articles in the late 1870s uh, on the subject, and then they were collected into this book entitled The Planting and Development of Missionary Churches. I, I should have pulled a copy off of my shelf uh, uh, on the other side of my office here to have that, but that book is still in print. You can find it online as well. And Nevius was critical of the inappropriate payment of foreign nationals to become professional minister, missionary representatives and the whole process of creating foreign missionary stations, which provided living quarters for the foreign missionaries, but kept them isolated from the people uh, for, uh, to whom that they'd been sent. And the indigenous church principles, which Nevius advocated, quickly became known as the Nevius method or the Nevius plan. Uh, and they were adopted into the Presbyterian mission and how they approached things in Korea. And so though they were developed by Nevius when he was in China, they were adopted in full by the missionaries laboring in Korea. And God's work done God's way will never fail for God's supply. And the Holy Spirit greatly moved and blessed. And, and we see the, the establishment of so many churches in Korea. And, and uh, I think the largest missionary force per capita in churches today is not from the United States. It's from Korea. Of more who are going out for the work of missions. Uh, today. Uh, and so the phenomenal growth of the Presbyterian Church in Korea is a notable chapter in the history of missions. So uh, that's important to understand um, when I talk about the three selves, these things arise from Scripture and were gathered together by uh, Nevius in, in this plan. Now, in our previous course, when I mentioned these three selves, we need to make sure these are not uh, what the communist Chinese in China are using, what they call the three self-patriotic movement uh, for their churches there. They adopted, you know, they wanted the churches self-governing, self-financing, self-propagating, basically to have no influence from outside of China, that only the communist party in China can have influence on anybody in China. And so we need to separate out those two things. What we are talking about is a biblical method here that was developed, uh, that was uh, uh, written down by uh, Nevius uh, to use. However, uh, others approach missions uh, from different organizational models and, and were not as successful as establishing good, solid <clears throat> biblically founded mature churches, churches that would mature uh, in the Lord. Uh, Rocky and I uh, uh, were discussing uh, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America um, and how they had sent missionaries into the Philippines who were more, they wanted to influence social leaders uh, in the Philippines and not really work on establishing biblical churches in that way. That reflected the theology of the Presbyterian Church USA at the time uh, that was not biblical in their thinking. And so 
If you're going to not be thinking biblically, what makes you think you're going to be doing church planting biblically? And, you know, that's, you know, you're, you're going to see the result of a lot of unbiblical stuff. And it's more about social change as opposed to the change that Christ makes in our hearts and builds us up and establishes us in him. All right. Um, something we need to see. This is the age of the harvest. Jesus said, open your eyes, look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And he says, pray, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And so he is signaling to us the dawn of a new age in the history of redemption. Uh, the age of the harvest. And as the book of Acts records this harvest growth, it always reminds us that God is in charge of it. Uh, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. We, we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Who added to the church? The Lord. Now, through the preaching and teaching of the apostles and the other disciples, God is blessing that. But you step back and say, it's not by my efforts. It was by God's. He's the one who has made this uh, to happen. And so, uh, you know, all who are appointed to eternal life believed, we read in Acts 13, 48. So we can therefore be optimistic as we plant new churches. It's going to be a struggle, uh, but we are harvesters. And this is the age of harvest. No rebellious, sin-hardened man, woman, or child is beyond hope because the sovereign Lord can and often does soften the hardest of hearts and gives them new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can be optimistic. We also are realistic because we are uh, pushing back against Satan. And we are in, in, and we can expect opposition, and uh, we can ex we can have feelings of defeat and discouragement, and wonder, Lord, what are we doing? What, why is it, you know? And and it it's it seems to fail here. Uh, why, Lord? We we tried to do things the way you had sovereignly established. Well, God is God, and He is Lord. He tells us to go. Now, we can expect blessing. We can expect opposition. But you know what? Um, sometimes our mission efforts, when they fail, are actually providing some groundwork later on when someone else can come in. And because of the previous work that was done, these efforts then may be blessed. And so... Uh, the Lord is sovereign and all that. And that's one of the things uh, we want to, we want it to succeed. We want the congregation to succeed, to be blessed, to grow in the Lord. But we need to be careful that what we're doing is not so it makes me feel proud of the work I've done, but that we are grateful to God for his blessing of this and that he receives the glory in it all. But God does indeed use our efforts. He tells us, you know, Tim, Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. Uh, we are to be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Uh, he tells Timothy, keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge the duties of your ministry. And so the importance of God's word in the work of evangelism and biblical church growth cannot be overemphasized. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing from what? The word of God. And, and this is the message. This word of Christ as proclaimed in the preaching and teaching of the gospel. So the salvation harvest occurs only as people are confronted with the lordship and saving work of Jesus Christ. 
but that requires hard work on the part of God's people. God uses our diligent efforts to bring in the harvest, to take the gospel to them, but also pray that the Lord would soften their hearts. Pray that the Lord would take that seed that is sown and it would be enfolded in their hearts and take root and grow up and produce fruit 30, 60, 100 fold for the glory of our Lord Jesus. Um, but we are the tools that God is using in this spread of the gospel itself. And we realize that it's God who causes the growth. Uh, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So God from all eternity has purposed to save a multitude of people through the sacrifice of his son and to assemble them into local expressions of his body called the church, the local church. And so the importance of God's initiative in biblical church growth is confirmed when Jesus said uh, to Peter, I will build my church. He didn't say men shall build my church, uh, nor to Peter, you shall build my church. But he said, I will build my church. So the church is supernaturally generated, comes forth from uh, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So biblical church growth is from beginning to end the work of God as he will bring in uh, the harvest. Well, what does this church look like? What does this uh, local congregation look like uh, biblically? What are the distinguishing characteristics of an organized uh, congregation or so uh, a biblically founded and ordered church mission work, uh, what it looks like ready to be organized as a new and separate congregation. One, it's assumed that the Protestant marks of a true church, uh, as Calvin and others had described them, are already present. Is there one, the true proclamation of God's word? Uh, second, are there flowing from that right proclamation of God's word, the right administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper? And then third, is there the faithful exercise of church discipline of those who are admitted into membership of the church uh, and also those who are... Uh, behaving unbiblically and refusing to repent? Are they kept away from the fellowship, the communion of the church, and not allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper? So is that organization bearing these three marks of the church, the right preaching of God's word, the right um, observance of the sacraments, right administration of them, and third, the right exercise of church discipline. Now, what follows are some of the time-honored characteristics which collectively describe the nature of a mature church in the Lord Jesus Christ, toward which all of our efforts are pointed to in the establishment of a congregation. One, is it self-sustaining? A mature church of the Lord is one which is able to sustain its ministry when there are sufficient people and finances, and they don't have to depend upon outside sources. They're not dependent on money coming from another congregation to support them in the work. If they're having to do that, they're not ready yet to be a... a a, a standalone congregation uh, of the church. Um, are the members there, are they committed to biblical giving patterns? And, and that congregation has enough of these people and enough income to meet its financial obligations, to support its pastor, 
to sustain its discipling and outreach ministries as a congregation and to provide for the widows and orphans uh, and the poor in their own congregation to take care of themselves. Uh, so self-sustaining. Uh, next, self-governing. A uh, mature church of the Lord Jesus Christ is one that has found and chosen from within its number a group of qualified God-appointed elders. And these men are the ones that the congregation has come together around the leadership of, of these men and, and a pastor whom they respect and to whom they will willingly submit to their direction. Now, of course, that direction always has to be biblical. You don't obey unbiblical direction. You, you obey what is biblically taught and, and, and enforced. Um, and so these leaders, um, and, and may also possibly the Lord raise up deacons at, at the same time in, uh, from that group. These are men who have shown themselves to be godly examples to the congregation and to be committed in belief and practice to the doctrinal standards uh, of the church. Now, uh, one of the principles uh, that we see scripturally is uh, we cannot impose elders from the outside and pastors and elders from the outside upon a congregation unless it's a mission work and it's still being organized. Uh, but once you're ready for organization, the people need to have a voice in electing of those men to rule over them. Um and let's say if, if you have a circumstance where you need some assistance from outside the church, maybe some of your own elders have fallen ill or moved away and you need some wisdom. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Um, we have a practice here where we will borrow an elder from another church to assist us temporarily until such time the Lord gives us another elder locally but even in the borrowing of that elder from another church, the people of your congregation have to vote to accept that leadership from that man who, whom you are borrowing from another congregation. And so it's not all of a sudden so, you know, we've got somebody from outside telling us what we have to do. This is someone whom we have said, you, you will rule. Uh, over us. You, you will be the ones directing the work uh, with us. Another self is self-propagating. A mature church of the Lord Jesus Christ is one that is shouldering its responsibilities both in the area of covenant faithfulness and in the area of carrying out the Great Commission. Uh, on the one hand, the congregation is seeing its own children, its own covenant children uh, of the congregation professing the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and taking up their responsibilities as members of, of the church. On the other hand, the congregation is consistently reaching out into the community with gospel witness and is seeing previously unconverted men and women and children professing faith in Christ and becoming responsible members of the church. In addition, the congregation is also taking up its responsibilities to go beyond the borders of their own community with outreach worldwide. So they're supportive of the work of missions and, and sometimes even of their own members are sent out as missionaries to surrounding communities or around the world. And so they are, they're just not all concentrated and thinking about us in our group, but they're also looking out to carry out the work of the gospel worldwide in some way, shape, or form. And, uh, and it is also um, assisting in this work financially as they're able, and, and in some of their own members are physically going into the world harvest field. And then the last of these selves here is they are self-consciously a church. A mature church of the Lord Jesus Christ is one that understands its ecclesiastical role and has defined its ecclesiastical commitments. It understands itself to be a church. 
uh, not a collection of individuals, uh, nor is it uh, a reform theology study club. Uh, we are a church. Uh, this is what we are about. And, and we are informed about the multitude of theological opinions within the reform system of doctrine, and we consciously chosen to be confessional without adopting a set of its own special emphases. You know, I pastored a church in Oklahoma where almost all of the children in the congregation were homeschooled. They didn't attend public schools. I think one or two might have been in a private Christian school. Um, but by and large, almost all of the children were uh, educated by their own parents at home. And somebody came up and said, oh, we're a homeschooling church. I said, no, we are not that. We are a church where a majority of our children are homeschooled, but we are not leading with a homeschooling church. We are a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we have somebody who comes in and, the, and in their convictions of educating their children, um, now we're all to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But if we choose the particular methodology uh, that we under which we do that, it, it's, let's say if we, we say, no, we're not going to homeschool them, we're going to send them to a Christian day school. Well, um, you know, we're not going to tell that person, oh, you can't be a member here because you're not homeschooling. That's that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is Jesus Christ of serving him. So we need to be careful that we are uh, not all embracing the same political opinion or that we are all, uh, oh, you know, you're not of this socioeconomic class and so forth. No, you, it's Jesus Christ. We keep him at the center of who we are and defined by Christ on how we uh, live together as, as a church. And so a mature congregation is going to learn to defer to others in love uh, in our decisions and in our conduct with one another. And, uh, and uh, we, we freely and happily have chosen to be part of also a biblical uh, denomination of churches uh, together uh, who express the same ideas, the same understanding of scripture, the same standards that we're holding one another accountable to. And we can embrace uh, this life together, uh, the heritage and values. And so uh, when you are establishing a new congregation, you also want to establish the right precedents uh, what is taking place. It is said that when George Washington became the first president of the United States under our current constitution, he went out of his way to ensure that every action of his public office was carefully considered beforehand, since he realized that everything he did was establishing a precedent. Uh, those involved in planting a new church should be aware that the way things are done and said in the earliest days of that church planting process often become the expectations and the stated norms uh, for years to come. So careful thought about establishing the right precedents in uh, a number of ways that we're going to be talking about uh, could make a significant difference in the progress of the development of a new mission work. And also understand too, sometimes those precedents that you've established become the established pattern of, of way things are, are done in that church. And people maybe 20 years later, oh, this is the way we've done it, um, not realizing why it was done that way at the beginning and think, oh, it has to be done this way. I often tell uh, young couples when they're coming to me uh, for counseling before they get married, uh, I say, you know, sometimes the way we do things in families are based on custom uh, and, the, and the, uh, the peculiarities of how our particular family does something are going to be different from another family. And sometimes we don't know the reason behind it. Uh, I tell the story of a uh, young woman, young young wife 
who uh, her husband has gotten a, a, a ham uh, for her to, to bake uh, and to cook that. And she would slice off a portion off of one side of the ham and set it aside. And she stopped and said, why am I doing that? Why, why, why am I doing this? And she got to thinking, said, well, I observed my mother doing that. And so, you know, maybe I, I, I should ask her, why, uh, why am I trimming this piece of ham off and setting it aside? And she asked her mother, mother, um, I, I noticed something growing up and I found myself doing this too of trimming the ham in a particular way and taking off part of the meat and setting it aside. We've got this. And the mother said, you know, I saw your grandmother do that. How do, you know, let's, let's ask uh, granny, uh, abuela, let's, let's ask her, uh, how, why are we doing it this way? And so the, the granddaughter and that mother went to the grandmother and said, Granny, why why are you, you know, we noticed this. And Granny started laughing. And she said to the mother of the grandmother, or of the, of the granddaughter, said, look, when you were a little girl, um, we were very poor and we only had one size pan in which to bake ham. And your father would buy these large hams and they wouldn't fit into the pan. So I always had to cut off an end of it and set it aside in order to, to cook it. <laughs> so, you know, oh, okay, that's why. But people, you know, she observed this as a little girl watching her mother do this. And then she fell into that habit, not knowing the reason behind it. And so that was communicated down to the granddaughter. And that's how she was doing things. So you, you see the point here, the precedent that we set in planting of a church can sometimes be transmitted down through the generations. And so uh, we need to be careful and think through why we're doing what we're doing and also to communicate why we're doing things in this particular uh, way. Um, and we should be aware that the way things are done and said in the earliest days of church planting often become the expectations and the stated norms for years to come. And so we need to think carefully about establishing the right precedents, um, for instance, in theology. There is nothing more practical in life and the life of a new church than sound biblical doctrine, sound biblical theology. A young congregation's theological underpinnings, undergirning, uh, foundation uh, in its earliest days will help protect it from error and keep it on a steady course. If you do not establish sound biblical teaching, sound biblical doctrine at the beginning in making the foundation, what you build upon that uh, is is going to be shaky. Um, you know, Jesus talks about building our house upon the rock and not upon the sand. So we need to make sure we're built upon the rock of, of uh, Christ and his word. Uh, because our Reformed faith is all all-encompassing in its scope, specific aspects of it sometimes also can be overemphasized as well. Uh, and, and and certain uh, implications of its teaching can inadvertently become a normative practice. And so we must be careful uh, early on that the we present a whole Bible doctrine, a whole establishment uh, on the basis of God's word and not side implications of it in order to uh, ensure the theological foundations of the new church. So uh, I would suggest that you teach through the catechisms of the church, uh, you know, depending on what uh, your theological tradition is and what you establish, you know, whether it's the Westminster 
uh, larger catechism, shorter catechism, the Westminster Confession of Faith, or the Three Forms of Unity, the Heidelberg Catechism, or and Belgic Confession, or the um, uh, uh, Canons of the Synod of Dort. But you you go through and you teach and you establish these things that this is the foundation. This is how we understand Scripture. But always understand these things, you know, emphasize these things must be subordinate to Scripture. The Bible alone is the standard. The and how we are to live things. And you and if people are constantly seeing you presenting us from the Scriptures constantly uh, seeing you base these things. This is what scripture teaches. You know, if you give a particular doctrine, back it up with the scriptures. This is that you're constantly referring. And so therefore, when any question arises in years to come, people will say, okay, we've got a guide for us here in these doctrinal standards, but ultimately what does the Bible say? And, and, and how do we uh, base our decision-making uh, in that way. Uh, another reason, uh, another establishment of a right precedent must be in your polity, how you uh, govern yourselves. Let's say if you establish a Presbyterian congregation uh, and, and you want its governance to be Presbyterian, uh, then it ought to function that way from the very beginning. Uh, for instance, it's unwise to create, uh, like here in the U.S., sometimes people would plan a church and have a steering committee of women and men at the very beginning for the purpose of involving people and encouraging people to lead. And then uh, the soon after, the uh, organizing church uh, that's helping get this new church established is okay we want these elders to come in and rule where you're going to have conflict between a steering committee and those organizing elders um and and in fact that you might have had women on that steering committee women you know they're going to think oh you know and you say no uh, biblically uh, leadership in the churches must be male only whom christ has appointed you've just set up a situation for a whole lot of conflict uh, and so you want to begin at the very beginning, having a, a biblical pattern of, of leadership. Um, so with careful instruction, submission to elders who help supervise a work from the outside, um, from the very beginning, will help it to progress uh, from the start of thinking Presbyterian-wise, thinking biblically on how that congregation is to be established. And, and then when it comes time to elect their own elders to rule over them, they've already learned to submit to a biblical group of elders. And, and, and so it's, it's no, it's, it, there's no uh, learning process. Uh, all of a sudden we've got, what does that mean to submit to them? What does that mean? You know, what is their role and function of elders? What are they are to be doing? And so forth. And, and these men who become the elders of that new congregation, once that congregation becomes formally established, they've already seen what it, these other men who are elders who have ruled over them temporarily, how they govern, and they provide a pattern for them. Now you want to make sure that those elders who come from the outside are good, solid men, or biblical elders, and are functioning as such for them, to provide the the right kind of example uh, for them. Um, also, uh, you want to establish the right precedent in administration. At the beginning of a new mission work, uh, it's it everybody's very uh, familiar with each other, and there's a friendly informality, kind of a family-like atmosphere in doing things. And so communicating information and how you count and <clears throat> deposit the, uh, the offerings, the tithes and offerings of the church, how you make arrangements and orderliness 
in the room where worship is conducted, all kinds of matters like that are often cared for in a very informal manner without much thinking through of the precedent uh, that is being established. But it's not going to take long for somebody to be offended over such matters as inappropriate counting uh, and handling of money or the apparent disrespect and preparation or disposal of uh, the elements of communion. And, and it's important that the members of the mission work volunteer to help and are actively involved in a multitude of tasks that need to be accomplished for the effective operation of the church's ministry. You know, if, if you, let's say uh, you have a church that is long established and, you know, the ladies of the church are the ones involved in, in helping to prepare the elements for the Lord's Supper and how it's done. And, and sometimes that's done over generations and there end up older ladies who are were very particular about how it has to be done and you have younger women who come in and they're assisting in that work and they don't understand how it was done by the older women and the older women get upset with the younger women and the younger women feel like they can't serve. And so they quit because they're being bossed around by the older ladies and so forth. And, and you've got uh, a situation that like, oh, you know, you as an elder are having to sort this out with them. But if you have everybody, you know, people rotating positions and getting accustomed to how things are done and, and, and communicate, communicate, communicate how we, we want to be able to do things and also to be open to change if necessary. And that's something else that um, you, you want to have people to become accustomed to and are gracious when it comes to change uh, and passing the, passing the responsibilities from one generation to the next, uh, how things are, are done. But you also want to uh, have a shared sense of responsibility, but also a shared sense of tradition, a shared sense of history, and so forth. Um, and so precedence and tradition often go hand in hand. Uh, the work of establishing a new church, uh, so much of what is done is new to those people who are involved. They've not been involved in something like this before. And, uh, you know, there's a lack of a sense of, of permanence. Is this going to last? How we, you know, you're always not feeling that you're on a, a good foundation here, uh, a long established procedure. And it sometimes is helpful to utilize the regular practices of carefully thought out activities or procedures as a way of engendering a sense of permanence for the new work. So, you know, do things like holding a monthly fellowship meal as you gather together as God's people. You present a scripture challenge to each new member at his or her reception into the congregation. You participate in an annual presbytery-wide camp for families. You hold an annual church banquet to celebrate the anniversary of the founding of the church. These are examples of positive establishment of traditions to encourage a sense of permanence in that new mission work. Uh, the, these collectively are, are things that people can get excited about and enjoy and, and so forth, but you need to make sure they are the right kinds of, of things biblically. Um, you don't want unbiblical practices to become traditions. Now, you need to be careful when, when people are wanting to bring in an, uh, an unbiblical practice that you explain to them why it's not right, why it's not good, and help them to see from Scripture. And that ultimately, it's not what you say as the organizing pastor, but what God's Word says as the reason why we don't want to do these things. And it sets a bad example and bad 
precedents. And we all know of churches where they've been long established and they've had some pretty bad traditions or some unbiblical practices have crept in. And woe be to you as the pastor if you try to dislodge that unbiblical practice because you are facing a, a, a lot of pushback from people who are emotionally attached to it. Or that's the way we've always done it. That's the way my mother or my grandmother or my great-grandmother did things. Well, it was wrong then. It's wrong now. But how you go about dealing with it uh, as a pastor, it, you, you need to come in, okay, this is what God's word says. You come in with gentleness. You come in with, okay, he, here's, here's why there's a problem with this. And make sure, too, that your elders are also understanding of this as well. And it may take a while to convince them and for them to see this and then to establish how these things are to be done. So basically this, this whole journey of church planting um, is a spiritual matter ultimately through and through. And you must be rooted in God's word, must be rooted in the truth of the scriptures and what you are doing in planting churches. And this is not something that we are to be engaged in half-heartedly. Uh, we must engage in this with all diligence, uh, attending to this work and a heart for God's kingdom in all this. But always remember God's work done God's way will never fail for God's supply for it as we trust him, as we labor for him and for his glory. Well, this helps us in establishing some uh, uh, foundation ideas of what we're going to be about in planting of, of biblical churches. Next time we're gonna to get together, we want to uh, talk about beginning a mission church, beginning a mission work. How do you go about establishing that? And there's different methods that are out there. Um, Biblically, how do we want to go about uh, doing this at, at the very beginning? We will not meet next Tuesday, April 2nd. I believe there, uh, Lord Seminary has some live lectures. Uh, Dr. Jim Cassidy uh, will be there. I, I, uh, Jim and I were messaging back and forth about his uh, coming to the Philippines, and he's excited about that. I, he is leaving today uh, to go to the Philippines. So pray for him for travel mercies uh, as he goes. Um, and so God willing, we will get together. I believe that the second Tuesday is April the 9th, I believe that will be. And we will post the link uh, on the Facebook chat uh, for uh, this uh, second lesson here and this course of biblical church planting. All right, um, let's take some time. If you have any questions uh, for me, we can entertain questions for a few minutes uh, before we log off. Um, <clears throat> The most of the churches uh, in, I am I cannot speak for the churches outside the Philippines, but so are already uh, planted churches, mm -hmm. whether uh, uh, right, but uh, Rocky. how they do things their churches so uh, i think uh the 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 idea the idea of biblical church planting should be uh re should, should be in a reformed way uh taught to to our churches mm -hmm. yes 
And we established, you know, the biblical way of going about doing this, we would say coming from our reformed theological basis, um, because we try to establish, uh, try to uh, base this upon scripture. Um, yeah, that, that, and our reformed understanding of the church, our ecclesiology is important. Because if we go about planting a, a church that is totally independent from everybody else and, and has no connection, you know, we've not planted a Presbyterian church. We have this common body of understanding of doctrine and, and ways that we have committed to uh, walking together uh, in the Lord uh, in, in those particular ways. And so, yeah, we need to be very careful you know, that we're not planting, we're not planting an Anglican church. We're not planting a Baptist church. We are planting a Presbyterian and Reformed uh, church. And how, what that looks like with local elders and with also the connection to other churches as well, that we maintain the self-governing, self-propagating, um, uh, self-financing um, or self-supporting and also self-consciously uh, that we are a congregation. So we, yeah, we, we must have that basis to do that. Um, where you've already have an established church, you, you kind of have to go back in and work harder uh, to change it. You know, let's say if you, if you have an ocean liner and, and you sometimes feel like you're kind of swimming against it, trying to get it to change course, <laughs> And you're pushing against it, you know, it that momentum that the ocean liner has, it, you know, you think there's no way you're going to get them to change on that. Well, the Lord can eventually change. And you begin with the elders of that church, the the and that they embrace this, not just because it's something the preacher has said, but because this is what the Bible says. And and they they can express this truth itself. Then that helps in changing the direction, changing the course of, of that congregation to be more biblical in in their thinking and understanding of how they do things. Thank you for uh, uh, answering my uh, my comment and question. Okay. Uh, John. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, brothers, and we will see you, God willing, in two weeks. And uh, Rocky, are you going to be recording Jim's uh, lectures there and posting them as well? I will. I will try. Uh, uh, I will try to find ways to to maybe uh, produce a packet Wi-Fi because the the venue that we're, when we are going to hold our conference has no wi-fi of itself but mm. i think uh, i i can procure uh, a packet wi-fi in order for me to record uh, dr cassidy's uh, lectures okay okay that'll be great all right brothers god bless uh rocky would you close us in prayer please let's pray our father lord in heaven we thank you because of once again you have uh, given us the privilege of learning of how to biblically plant a church and that these things we you we, we can learn from your word and thank you for using Pastor John uh Pastor John Owen Butler to to share us uh, his uh, learning about these things his experience how he he found uh, he, he read it he learned it from your word. We pray that you uh, uh, continually give us uh, same privilege and opportunities to to learn you learn of your word and to grow in the knowledge of yourself. We thank you and we pray that uh, uh, for 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 that 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 the things that we have learned uh, that it may not remain academic, but uh, we we can apply this in our uh, uh, respective churches in 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 every locality in which we belong whether in the philippines in myanmar or in Cam cambodia india or in the us we pray that you will 
reform your church. We pray that you will give us the zeal to 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 uh to preach the gospel, to to preach the authentic gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you will bless all our efforts without which we we cannot do anything. We we cannot accomplish anything. Bless, O oh Lord, your work in every country in Asia. These things we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Lord bless.